私たちは見捨てられたんだ。だから壁に囲まれた周囲を。Reiner? 私たちには悪魔を見せてるからね。Best mom, best mom of all time. お父さんは。Oh! マーレジンだから。Oh! So Reiner is half. マーレジンに生まれて。Oh no! <笑> no! Imagine being Kid Reiner and going through this. Oh no, no, no. Honestly, this hurts me so bad. This seems really obvious to me now, but it's just sort of hitting me that his pain doesn't start when he gets to the penal colony. His pain starts living as an Eldian with a Marlian father and a single mother who, like, uses him as a peer of sorts or a friend or an outlet for her, her pain. That's just way too much for a kid to have to endure. His face says it all, right? Like, what that is, is. Somebody who realizes his world is not safe. I mean, his world obviously isn't safe, right? But just speaking to his development, he can't even count on his mother. Right now, in this scene, he's, he's the emotional support for the only parental figure in his life. I feel like what that does to you is it just makes you incredibly secure about your, your world, the workings of your world and your own safety. Look at that face. Look at it. That's extra sad because they, they never will be. They never could be. That's the game. Is that little Annie in the back? Is that little Bert Holt? How do you feel about shoulder pads? <laughs> oh, but that's, that's a lot, though. That goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. Rainer really believes in this. Or believed in it. Oh no! Bertholdt taking care of him from the beginning. Man, this hurts me so bad. Ah,、oh, Bertholdt. Right, right. It just depends on what they're looking for. <laughs> Always so aloof. Even as a kid. Was she grinding up that grasshopper or that insect? This means so much to Reiner, though. Probably more than to most people. Because this is his whole, like, his whole world, his whole stability. It's his mother. It's his missing father. Yeah, that mother conversation was super important. That was a, a key flashback. <laughs> oh. Oh. This is, this is a lot of Reiner backstory. This is amazing. <laughs> Whoa, are we gonna get to see him actually attack the wall? I don't know if I, I want that. I want it. I am so here for this. <laughs> Reiner backstory episode. I'm ready to be validated for all my beliefs in, in, in his, his warmth, his heart, his spirit. The door of hope. Is it always female? Is that just like part of its nature? I expect nothing less from Mikasa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's symbolic for his, his human nature. Right, this was part of the plan until Ymir came along. And carrying backpacks. And it turns out, gun turrets, which is a total game changer, peak. And we got a, this tall boy, Bertolt. <laughs> I could actually. See Berthold as a being a, a great fit for this, come to think of it, just because you don't want to give this to the wrong guy. Man, they were, they were already experienced by the time they got to the penal colony. Yeah, suck it, Pac. Oh, man. This whole interaction is just. It's perilous. It's not what you thought it would be, is it? That's terrible. To me, watching this, it feels to me like. Reiner was kind of doomed to go down this path, and it speaks well of him that he's even having conflict about it at all. Reiner grew up in a household where he was immediately made aware of the precariousness of his own existence and his mother's existence. Personally, I think we all need things to believe in, and some of the more common things to believe in, some of the better things to believe in, are things like family, friends, community, even pursuits, dreams, things like that. But I think sometimes when there's a lot of instability, especially for kids, or you don't have the right things to believe in, 
you end up believing in just the first thing that's presented to you or whatever is the most widely available belief that's presented to you. As a child, he's going to be looking around for a structure, which is just something kids do. And all he's finding is this panicked, grief-stricken woman. And so the next best thing, I guess, is just what the Marleyans are telling him to do, like the messages among his peer group, among his society. And so his believing in this is not just an idle thought he has. It's a matter of survival for him. It's something he can focus on to get him through the emotional turbulence of his daily reality. And so for me, I understand why, even though he at heart is a good kid who is capable of like kindness and love and would care about people he meets in the penal colony like Aaron and Armin and all this stuff, why he would still cling so heavily to these old beliefs, to this way of thinking. It's because he has to believe in this with that level of emotional intensity for his own survival. And this actually is frighteningly common. You know, like I think a lot of our beliefs are just things that we incorporated into ourselves as children to help us get through the day, you know, to help us get through our lives. But problems occur when those are not re-examined later as an adult. Like we, we tend to carry these beliefs all the way through to adulthood. And the deeper you go, the more you have to defend them because it's like your entire being. And so it's really common for us to push out any evidence to the contrary of our beliefs, just because that would mean rebuilding our entire selves and going back to that point of vulnerability. So sometimes we'll cling to ideas that give us a group identity, you know, somewhere to belong to the point where there's some humanity lost and it just becomes about winning or defending those beliefs at any cost. This is it. This is happening. This is legit like their expedition. <laughs> Always faithful. Well, when you say we reach the wall, <laughs> got some bad news for you. He took charge really quickly. Uh? Come again? Oh, wow. But his brother ends up becoming a titan anyway, right? That's who that is. Sorry, that just clicked for me. So he wasn't chosen. And there's Ymir. The timing of this. Very dramatic day in their lives, <laughs> to say the least. I think once as a joke or in the state of grief that came after seeing what happened to Marco, I asked a rhetorical question to Annie and Berthold since they can't hear me about why would you let Reiner lead? And one thought I just had watching that scene is that even though we like to think it's the most capable people who end up leading, a lot of times, unfortunately, it just comes down to the people who have the most conviction in what they're doing. It's weird because I think, you know, one important part of intelligence is like thinking things through and having a sort of creative approach to ideas, having some kind of a balanced perspective. And I think that Annie and Berthold and this other guy whose name I've already forgotten, even though I just saw him get eaten. They are slightly more reasonable and you might say healthy than Reiner. And so they're, they're kind of, they got their doubts, right? But Reiner doesn't have doubts. And so he gives them an out. Like they can just put their faith in someone who is convicted to kind of soothe themselves from, from the agony of like this conflict, this back and forth. It's almost like people like that, you know, people who are really convicted, people who are really strong in their views, give people an excuse to put down some of their, their more critical thinking and just go with things. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's important to follow some of the cliches like, you know, following your conscience, listening to your heart, because sometimes the things that are right are unpopular in that moment or somebody really confident, really strong is leading in, in a different direction. So like the, the self will to not fall into that trap of just following the confident one, right? Not following the, the group, let's say, is essential for avoiding some of the real evil things that can occur. Good start to the mission, huh? Just as we planned. And this is only the beginning. Oh, and they lost their official leader. あんたはこのまま帰れば鎧を剥奪されて、次の戦士に食われる。私の知ったことじゃないけど。Classic <laughs> Annie. She cares though.そんなすぐに巨人の力が使えるわけ。お前はすぐに超大型を使いこなしただろうが。とにかくこのままじゃ俺たちはおしまいなんだよ。you forget, but I love all this reinforcement in the show that Bertolt's actually a badass, like he's capable of anything. <laughs> Classic Annie. She cares, though. She cares. <laughs> Best friends. Comrades. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. That's a lot. Okay. Damn, Annie. I feel like this is the second time we've seen her true 
her true self after that weird creepy laugh. <laughs> Berthold just silently <laughs> crying. <laughs> oh no, these poor kids. They just never stood a chance. Like, how are they supposed to navigate this? Three lost kids versus three lost kids. Who knows how far they even thought this through. The perspective is so different from that first episode to now. It's just this troubled kid in this giant armored titan body. They come across as so like powerful, intimidating, and then the aftermath. They saw them. So finding out for the first time that they were kids when this happened changed the perspective on the whole event. But something about seeing it through their eyes changes it even further. They don't know what the hell they're doing. Like they're fighting amongst each other. They're terrified. They're not at all capable of thinking about the people inside the wall, right? The crimes they committed are terrible and unforgivable. But while this might be controversial, watching this, it's hard for me not to feel some sympathy for them. For me, part of evil is the knowledge of pain that you're causing and the desire to cause that pain. Doing things you know will cause tragedy because of some hatred in your heart you know and i think that there there's some of that here but i think largely this is just them like being scared and while ultimately i believe that everything that we do is our own responsibility at the end of the day like any action you take you took right that's all there is to it and while there definitely is evil in this i feel less of that hatefulness for others desire to cause pain in this world and more of just them like fighting for survival trying to please the only structure that they know thinking about their families back home you know it's very complicated <laughs> don't answer that <laughs> oh he well i mean in his mind it's on the truth this honorary marleyan status is such a lie such a joke. Oh, they stole this this dude's story. So that was all a lie, huh? One of many. Is that Kenny? Did any fight Kenny? <laughs> they were hunting for the founding titan. And they were getting close. They were living quite the double life. That's what kept them around. That makes sense. It does seem like it was Reiner who was keeping them there. It means way more to him. Yeah, he's going to keep him here. Right. Right. And now here's the second, the second coming right after graduation. No, Reiner, no. So at this point, what I said about evil, now I feel applies more strongly to Reiner in this situation. Because now he's had enough time, right? Like now he's more of an adult. He's been with these people. To willingly do this is a lot more at this point than it was when he first, you know, knocked down the gate. The conflict between them makes a lot of sense. I feel like Annie knows something's wrong on some level, but she sort of needs Reiner. Like she's resting on Reiner a little bit and that's got to build resentment. Give him a shoulder pat to cheer him up. Oh, he's been, he's had quite the training. He fought a whole war before this. Something familiar about that, yep. Very important moment. Two lost kids, two lost souls, Reiner and Aaron. You could still do something good. You could still do some good. It won't make it better, what happened in the past, but you could still do something good. I'm confused. Is it Aaron? Wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm so lost. <laughs> I'm so lost right now. Wait, what? How did they... When have we seen this guy before? Is Aaron a spy here? Is he the guy who was reading the newspaper? Very observant. Yeah, she won the war. 
なんでこんなことになったんだろうって心も体もむしろまれ徹底的に自由を奪われ。Oh no, stop thinking. Too much nuance. You're gonna get caught. みんな何かに背中を押されて地獄に足を突っ込むんだ。大抵その何かは自分の意思じゃない。他人や環境に強制されて仕方なくだ。Wow, interesting. 自分で自分の背中を押したやつの見る地獄は別だ。進み続けたものにしかわからない。<laughs> gotta be Aaron. <laughs> Pretty sure. Got a feeling. Good news is he made it to the other side of the sea. The bad news is he's never gonna be satisfied. I don't know what to make of Aaron in that speech. So the first part makes sense to me. In fact, I think it's a big part of the episode. Like, there are people who are sort of launched out into the world on a trajectory, and that trajectory was not one of their own choosing, at least to a certain degree, right? Like, it was something that they were told to believe. It was the faith that they chose in the absence of having other things to believe in. And that's actually not such a bad thing. And I think that's how all people start. But there has to be that second part where people sort of reconsider the path they're on as adults or as more mature people and then question who they really are and what they actually want. And sometimes all that takes is just waking up to the fact that the trajectory you're on is not your own trajectory, even though it, it often feels like it is. It's just something that was handed to you, something you adopted to stay safe or to have something to believe in to keep you going, to give you structure. Like Reiner and you know, wanting to destroy the, the paradise colony so that he can actually have a world in which he belongs. But then the second part of that is that there are people who push their own backs. And he talks about that as potentially hope, but also potentially a kind of hell, which is really interesting to me. Because for me, that's where the fun begins. That's where life starts. That's self connection. If I have to think about ways in which that could be a personal hell, it does kind of hurt in a way to. Realize that the only thing that will ever have any responsibility for your own life is yourself. You know, like having that realization that your life is in your own hands and that you can do what you want to do and that you're not necessarily dictated by, you know, the whims of other people or by society or what people want you to believe for their for their own gain. You're left with like ultimate personal responsibility and that can be terrifying. There's no safety anymore in blame. There's no safety anymore in leaning on people who are not wise but are overconfident, which is another thing in this episode. It's scary because now, for the first time, you can fail because you have things that you want. You have your own visions of who you want to be and what you want to do, and you're on the hook, right? Like, there's no, there's no one else to blame. Because your life is your own. So that's one possible aspect of it, but that doesn't feel like it's what he's saying. I'm wondering if he's saying something like, there's no satisfaction to be had in that. It's an endless quest or like a fire that, that burns you constantly. The hunger, maybe. And I get that on some level, but to me, that doesn't feel like a hell. To me, that feels like being alive. It feels like connection to life. I think it can become a negative thing. It can become hellish if it's not clear what those things actually are, or you actually haven't hit some truth about what it is yet, or about who you are yet. To me, what that feeling suggests is often that you're still sort of on something, some other path, a path that's not totally genuine. Aaron is, is a confusing case, you know, because there's just so many inputs, I'm not really sure what to make of it, because we know he's been like this since he was a child. We know he's a very black and white binary thinker and is very passionate, very driven, but we also know that some of his thinking, some of his memories are not necessarily him. They might be partly incorporated from previous Titans, previous Titan owners. And And then you add to the fact that there's something like a time connection, you know, like maybe his future self was the thing communicating with his past self. At this point, I don't really know what his motivation is. I don't know what he actually wants, and so I can't imagine what would ever satisfy him. I wonder if maybe that false belief that's pushing him on is something like needing to believe that he's special or needing to believe that he's a hero. And maybe that's echoed by the similarity they, they pose between him and Reiner, you know, both striving for that, both striving for that, that identity of. Doing something big and being a hero and saving the Marlins or the world or whatever. But to me, they're both sort of wrong. Like, you don't have to save the world to be worthwhile. You don't have to save the world or do grand things to be great. I think it's greater to, you know, live purely and without delusion and without pretense and to refine your own personal values. You know, I don't know. It's very confusing. But anyway, this episode was really amazing for Reiner, Annie, and Berthold. It gave them so much more life. Like, I already liked them, but this episode really highlighted the sense of them being lost. Like, really lost kids. They just don't know what the hell they're doing. And in that sense, I think I have a little more sympathy for them. I think the hardest thing to stomach for me still is the fact that Reiner was willing to push this idea even after all that, you know, all the training. After he'd gotten to know all his fellow cadets. That's rough, buddy. And then the burning question of what is Aaron doing? What, why is he here? I feel like I missed something important, as usual, because. I'm guessing Aaron was the guy reading the newspaper in episode one, but I missed how he got injured and I missed the connection he has to, to Falco. Like, they seem to know each other. So I appreciate in advance you guys letting me know what I missed there. But yeah, that's the end of episode three. Where do we go from here now that Aaron's on the island? Okay.